session. We've been galloping through the UK's creative industries at quite a pace, uh, and it will be lunchtime soon, but I can't let you go to lunch without first touching on the economic contribution of theatre. Uh, this is a nation of drama lovers. We are right now barely a mile from London's West End, which, with Broadway, sits at the very top of the world's most popular destinations for theatre. Well, we have here today Nick Allott, who's the managing director of Cameron Mackintosh, the company responsible for some of the most famous musicals of recent years, including Cats, Les Miserables, and Mary Poppins. And Nick is now going to be speaking to Julian Bird, who's chief executive of the Society of London Theatre. So please welcome Nick and Julian. Claire, thank you. Uh, actually, I'm going to speak first and then Nick. Um, but first of all, we thought um, it wouldn't be right. Everybody else has shown you a great uh, piece of uh, footage. So here, first of all, to put into context is our sort of international promotional video at the moment, all about London theatre. Thank you. It's, uh, it's Nick and my great pleasure to be able to stand here and talk about what's one of the oldest of the UK's uh, creative industries, the theatre. Obviously, the United Kingdom has a very rich history uh, in this important cultural field, and this continues today to an extent that's possibly even more important than at any time in the past. It's my great privilege to run the two bodies that actually coordinate theatre in the UK, both the physical uh, buildings, many of which are incredibly historic in themselves, uh, but also the productions that fill them. You've had just a little taste on the video there, but there truly is something just in London at the moment for everybody, from classic straight plays to new comedies, uh, from brand new musicals to reinterpretations of the great classics, and from dance and opera, both modern and traditional. The TMA, the Theatrical Management Association, was established in 1894, covering theatre outside London. And in 1908, Sir Charles Wyndham founded the Society of London Theatre, um, which is the organisation that represents producers and theatre owners for both the commercial and the grant-aided theatres <coughs> in central London. A little bit more on that in a minute. We combine uh, the traditional roles in areas such as employment relations and legal affairs uh, with the role in advocating for theatre and investment in theatre, both in the UK and overseas. We also run all the central services uh, for London theatre, where it is more economical for us to do that as an industry rather than individuals doing that on their own. So, for example, I have the great joy of producing the annual Olivier Awards, celebrating the excellence in London theatre, and there's many people in this room who actually help us with that. Um, our thanks enormously. And most excitingly, and just some of the things you can see on the screen, we do a lot to champion uh, audience development programmes to promote theatre going to new audiences, young and old. 
To put the size and impact of the theatre industry in the UK into perspective, just a few key statistics. Despite what uh, our cousins across the pond sometimes say, London continues to this day to have the biggest commercial theatre sector in the world, uh, with over 14 million visitors each year. That is actually growing as we sit here this year. And revenues of about £530 million just on ticket sales alone. Outside London in the main theatres, and it's hard to quantify because of all the community theatre, but in the main theatres uh, we estimate at least 16 million. So that's over 30 million uh, in the UK at least, which interestingly is equivalent to all attendees at all Premiership football matches and all Football League Premier matches added together each year. Putting it another way, the recent Department of Culture, Media and Sport um, taking part survey concluded that nearly 30% of the adult population in England, and only England I'm afraid, visited the theatre last year. Truly large figures. In London, musicals account for about 59% of attendees, plays 27%, with dance, opera and entertainment making up uh, 14%. And perhaps most importantly, um, as Claire said, just a mile down the road, in a relatively small part of central London, in the West End, the overall economic impact is estimated currently to be around £2.5 billion a year. But there's arguably one element which makes the UK theatre sector so unique, which is that we have in this country this amazing blend of both subsidised and commercial theatre sitting alongside each other. The UK has a long history of publicly subsidised arts, with a mix of central government subsidy through a series of national arts councils, but this coupled with local subsidy through town and city councils. <clears throat> this has led not only to the strength of our, of our major national companies, the National Theatre, the Royal Shakespeare Company, the Royal Opera House and Sadler's Wells, to name but four of the most famous, but also strong regional theatre presences, the length and breadth of the country. Over many years, this support locally has aided an invaluable training ground for thousands of people, not just the actors, but creative talent in all its guises. Indeed, back to last Friday in that extraordinary opening ceremony, the main people involved in that opening ceremony cut their teeth in major subsidised theatres around the country. It truly was their training ground. Danny Boyle at the RSC and the Royal Court, Stephen Daldry at Sheffield Theatres and the Royal Court. And many of the top directors, designers and other creative talents involved in many of Hollywood's major movies of the last decade, as Michael and others have mentioned, also have this amazing background in regional subsidised theatre. The impact of this has never really been quantified in an economic sense, but it's a valuable byproduct of successive governments' important investment in the performing arts in this country. Support of this type also leads to the ability in the UK to incubate projects over a longer period of time. The most recent example of this is maybe War Horse, and Michael Morpurgo is here this afternoon. But the national theatre work that was done to workshop that extraordinary production uh, happened over many, many years. This has gone on, as you know, to be one of not only London's biggest and most popular and well-attended shows, but is now literally rolling out across the world. And the rest of the UK will get an opportunity to see that uh, when it tours here next year. Indeed, it's sometimes when the expertise in subsidised theatre comes together with that commercial expertise that magic can truly happen. Later on, we actually look forward to giving you a taste of some live theatre just before lunch, um, when we welcome London's newest smash hit musical, which itself is about to start its worldwide transfer. More on that later, but that truly is an example of a major subsidised company working with the commercial talent in the West End to bring that to fruition. Nick Allett is going to speak in a moment about the export of UK shows and theatrical creativity worldwide, but I think it's worth just a small mention um, of the importance of the transatlantic cooperation that we enjoy with the New York theatre community. This covers productions, talent, but also, crucially, investment, which flows both ways across the Atlantic. Needless to say, the theatrical community's work in outreach, education and cultural identity continues to be essential parts of the sector's work. And the support of thousands of individual and corporate organisations also shouldn't be overlooked. Truly, we believe we can claim in the UK to have the largest, most diverse and most successful theatre scene in the world. Successful not just in pure economic terms, but also successful in the large volume of jobs that it offers and successful in the contribution that we believe it continues to offer to our cultural landscape. 
but that's about the UK, to talk about the importance of UK theatre worldwide. Nick Allett. Thank you, Julian. Um, at the Oscars, if you overrun, they, put, they start to play the orchestra loudly, so if you hear some strings, please bear with me. I'll go as quickly as I can. I don't want to keep you from your lunch. Um, we've heard some really very impressive presentations from leading figures in the film world today, representing some of the most successful movie franchises in history. It may, therefore, I hope, surprise you to discover that the single highest grossing piece of entertainment is not one of these films, nor is it The Great Avatar, nor is it Titanic, but it is the musical play of The Phantom of the Opera with over $5 billion grossed worldwide still rising, followed closely by the musical play of Les Miserables with $3 billion, and which in turn, as you saw from the working title clip, is soon about to be a major motion picture. These massive stage productions stand shoulder to shoulder in box office terms with the greatest of Hollywood's successful titles and are joined by other musical plays such as Cats, Miss Saigon, Mamma Mia, Disney's The Lion King and Mary, po Mary Poppins. Hello, Julian Fellows. Um, all of these titles were created within the UK, with the exception perhaps of The Lion King, but most of that was written by two Englishmen, Elton John and Tim Rice. They represent the musical renaissance of London theatre during the 1980s, which went on not only to become a huge British export, but changed the way theatres produced around the world. Most of these plays emerged as Britain crawled out of the recession of the late 1970s into the aspirational 1980s, and then spread global, globally into economies that were themselves beginning to boom again. The titles became, as it were, international franchises, the difference being the level of hands-on control exerted in each market by the originating producers, necessary to oversee the quality of each reproduction and to ensure that the audience in that city had an experience as close to the original in London as possible. Very quickly, musical theatre became a significant British export, bringing substantial revenues back to British companies in the UK in the form of royalties, rentals and profits from overseas productions. For most of the last century, traditional markets for live musical theatre were the English-speaking North Americas and Australia. The first of the newer markets to recognise the economic potential of blockbuster musicals was the tiger economy of Japan. And it is significant that 20 years and one and a half billion dollars at the box office later, these titles all remain in the performing repertoires of the largest Japanese companies. In the US, the British created a new production model, opening offices and production companies in New York to reproduce their own work, rather than licensing them to their American counterparts as, as they've done in the past. This led to a hugely increased roster of British plays and creative talent in New York and on into the touring cities of America. At one point in the early 90s, it was calculated that 60% of all stage actors employed in North America were working in shows produced by just two British producers, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Cameron McIntosh. As in London, the New York Port Authority and the League of American Producers carefully calculate the annual economic impact that live theatre has on its economy. For 2011, the most recent set of statistics available, Broadway shows, many of them British, contributed $11.2 billion to the New York economy, not including an additional $550 million of local taxes paid to that city. 86,000 people were employed directly by the theatre industry that year, and another 75,000 indirectly in related tourism and leisure sectors that directly support theatre-goers. Europe and modern musical theatre were not natural bedfellows until the 90s. The European model of state and local subsidy to their theatres in each city meant they had an obligation to present a balanced and varied programme of work which negated the possibility of extended multi-month runs of one title, which is necessary for commercially based musicals. It was an enterprising German hedge fund manager who persuaded the city of Hamburg to let him take over a city-owned, run-down theatre on the Reeperbahn, rent-free, for a production of Cats that he told them would run for 15 weeks. Ran for over 10 years. On the evidence of that potential, and with no way out of the subsidy dilemma, over the next 10 years, another German financier embarked upon an ambitious programme of theatre building in Germany to accommodate these new musicals from abroad, and, as he hoped, ultimately promote the development of domestically grown product. His biggest theatre complex, built specifically for our show Miss Saigon, on the outskirts of Stuttgart, contained a 1,600-seat theatre, two hotels, restaurants, a shopping arcade, and its own underground railway station. A massive capital investment to support one production, a project which was budgeted to recoup its total costs if the show played nine years at capacity. I'm glad to say Miss Saigon played for ten. 
Further capital investment on the same scale resulted in brand new theatres being built especially for British and American musicals in Duisburg, Hamburg, Frankfurt, Stuttgart again, and Wiesbaden, in one particular case, Bochum, which was selected primarily because of its proximity to the main arterial autobahns linking the major cities in the south and east of that country. The Bochum production of Starlight Express runs today, 20 years later, generating 25 million euros annually for that town and producing over half a million um, hotel bookings. In much of the rest of Europe, the story is, if not exactly the same, similar. If you drew a line horizontally through the middle of Europe, you'd see two very different theatrical cultures. The northern and Scandinavian countries have embraced musical theatre in disproportionately large numbers. It was estimated in its initial run in the late 80s, in the brand new National Theatre in Oslo, 25% of the population of Norway saw so, so Les Miserables. With the breakup of the USSR and the relaxation of state control, in the past few years, most of the Baltic states and countries that were traditionally seen as being behind the Iron Curtain have all mounted, and they continue to mount, their own production of these big British shows. The so-called Mediterranean countries have not yet shown the same enthusiasm as their northern counterparts, but lengthy runs of Les Mis and Lion King in Madrid within the past two years have demonstrated, even in chronically difficult economic times, the Spanish will go to the theatre in sufficient numbers to sustain a run of a single play for more than a year, something unheard of a few years ago. And with unemployment at record levels in so many of these countries, a labour-intensive uh, industry like live theatre is to be encouraged. Looking further east, the emerging economies are embarking upon capital projects to rival those of old Europe. The casino business model that operates with such success in Las Vegas is now replicated in Singapore, South Africa, Hong Kong and Macau, with plans for many more in Asian cities such as Manila and Bangkok, where large theatres are built within hotel and gambling complexes. Large shows are brought in, again mainly from the UK and the US, and they provide a magnet for inbound and domestic tourism, substantial local employment and generate considerable tax revenue for the local exchequer. In Australia, Sydney estimates the benefit of local musical theatre to their city at $70 million. The competition between Melbourne and Sydney is not limited to where the Grand Prix is staged, and their state governments now offer incoming producers marketing subsidy in excess of a million dollars per production as an inducement to open new shows in that city first. Having watched the US and Europe operate at what is virtually full theatrical capacity for the past 20 years, the challenge for us in the UK now is to try and replicate that theatrical success within the BRIC economies. Of those four, China is in so many ways the most exciting and simultaneously the most challenging. Since we first presented Les Miserables in English in Shanghai 10 years ago, after a warm but slightly unfocused invitation from their government to expand our businesses and to joint venture with Chinese partners, the past few years have seen a massive growth in the market for live musical theatre in China. In terms of the size of that market, one estimate places 100 million people on the eastern Chinese seaboard who could potentially afford to pay West End theatre prices. Between 2010 and 2013, 40 new theatres will open in Chinese cities, with two new major theatre developments already underway in Beijing and plans emerging to redevelop old and disused theatre buildings in Shanghai, where there are already several state-of-the-art theatre buildings. With a still embryonic indigenous musical theatre industry and yet a huge local commitment in terms of training creative personnel and capital investment in real estate, they're looking to us for new commercial theatre relationships, in addition to buying in more of the traditional Western opera and ballet touring product. The Chinese government's 12th five-year plan, commencing in 2012, moved culture from an emergent industry to a pillar industry, making it ultimately responsible for 5% of Chinese GDP. The theatrical productions that emanate from here, whether it be our musical productions I've mentioned here or global successes of plays such as The Mighty War Horse from the National Theatre or the entrancing Matilda from the Royal Shakespeare Company, should provide the bedrock for these new buildings for the years ahead and consequently bring substantial revenue streams back to the UK. The only emergent and yet now one of the biggest economies that has so far resisted all Western theatrical blandishments is India. But with Bollywood films representing such a potent force in their culture and economy, and with so many of the performance elements in those films being common to traditional Western musical theatre, we hope that out there, or maybe in this room, is an Indian entrepreneur who will come forward to work with us to replicate the success that so many other countries have enjoyed. And now, Julian is going to introduce you a very special treat. In true theatrical uh, style, the stage is now just being set, but uh, 
you could just give us one moment. Okay. It's our actually enormous pleasure to introduce uh, what's going to happen now, which is a live extract from uh, a current musical in London that has swept the board in the last awards season, winning no less than seven uh, Olivier Awards. Matilda the Musical was commissioned by the Royal Shakespeare Company, opened at their home in Stratford-upon-Avon, and then transferred to London's West End at the end of last year. It takes Roald Dahl's original story, and through Dennis Kelly's book and Tim Minchin's clever lyrics and songs, transports us into the world of a little girl with some extraordinary powers as she battles her way through her childhood, her parents, and her headmistress. To sing the song Quiet, from Matilda, please welcome one of the four amazingly talented girls that share the lead well that share the lead role. Ladies and gentlemen, Haley. Inside my head, I'm not just a bit different from some of my friends. These answers that come into my mind unbidden, these stories delivered to me, fully written. And when everyone shouts like they seem to like shouting, the noise in my head is incredibly loud. And I just wish they'd stop my dad and my mum, and the telly and stories would stop for just once. I'm sorry, I'm not quite explaining it right. But the noise comes anger, and the anger is light. Is burning inside me would usually fade, but it isn't today. And the heat and the shouting, and my heart is pounding, and my eyes are burning. And suddenly, everything, everything is quiet. Like silence, but not really silent. Just that still sort of quiet. Like the sound of a page being turned in a book. Or a pause in a walk in the woods. Quiet Like silence but not really silent Just that nice kind of quiet Like the sound when you lie upside down in your bed just the sound of your heart in your head And though the people around me Their mouths are still moving And the words they are forming Cannot reach me It is quiet and I am warm like I've said. 